Uh, the transformation, from my perspective, uh, a couple of the key aspects are reducing uh, the total cost of use. You can see total cost of ownership. You could use various uh, terms for this. I'm going to spend a little time talking on the, uh, on the building and the construction kind of emphasis of the GeoBIM uh, concept here uh, this morning. And so using a building example, you know, 40% of the buildings, uh, at least there was a study done in the U.S. where 40% of buildings are used at any time, which means 60% of the facilities just unused. Right? And so these planning concepts that, uh, that we're going to get into with understanding um, facilities, understanding space, and that geospatial environment is, is critical to how we can get more use and better return on our investments of these assets. From the, uh, the second aspect is talking about a, a better uh, freedom in, in our design and uh, in the environment that we can, that we can provide. Um, I'll talk about some aspects there. And then the reduced waste and uh, inefficiency, and I mean, when I talk about this bullet, it's from what I would call lean to green. So both on the construction side of it, there's lean aspects in prefabrication, modularization. Um, there's green aspects even in the construction phase of reducing fuel and, uh, and those aspects. And then there's the actual uh, uh, inhabiting or, or leveraging of that infrastructure and the green aspects that come with the energy analysis and, and the things that we talked about here. Uh, here this morning. So we'll talk about those various aspects. I think the first thing is, as I talked about, coming together is the, is the key here. And, uh, and, and so if the, the f first premise is that we have to look at this across the life cycle um, and leveraging and liberating and working together kind of this network uh, across, uh, across the life cycle. And that life cycle can start with raw land. Um, geospatial uh, professionals getting out there and doing data acquisition on an environment, um, surveying, permitting, uh, dealing with the raw land through infrastructure, through the actual vertical assets, and, uh, and then into operating that infrastructure or communities um, and going across. And what I do understand too is not everything's greenfield. So those, this the picture depicts a nice flow of that life cycle. The reality is a majority of our work starts with existing. Um, infrastructure that we are going to, uh, to renovate against. So the key uh, transformation enablers that I want to talk about, these are kind of the chapters, is BIM. Uh, there's many definitions to BIM. I'll give you kind of my thoughts on where I believe BIM can help, especially in context to coming together with the geospatial information. Um, on the geospatial side of it, I put uh, spatial as my word, so just be a little bit more broad in that it's maybe not always geodetic information, but it can be uh, location and awareness and presence in space. Uh, and then, as we talked about, sorry, you heard this morning, this information aspect and people coming together, there's networks that have to happen here and collaboration that has to happen. So I want to spend a little bit of time uh, on those enablers and then talk about some concepts with workspace management and even highlight uh, the edge here in Amsterdam and some other projects where, where you can see a number of these enablers and work all in, in one, one place. So we'll start with BIM. Uh, you know, uh, BIM, again, has many definitions, so I'm not here to tell you my definition is, is, uh, is the correct one. But pre, you know, and BIM also, though I'm going to talk about the building uh, and vertical uh, examples here, I will also talk about some infrastructure examples. Infrastructure has been using concepts of BIM. But I think in, in some regards, the infrastructure uh, community is a little ahead of us in that they've been marrying constructible level models and information, intelligent information with spatial data for some time, I think before BIM was cool or, uh, <laughs> or the, the hot topic. But uh, you know, uh, for me, the evolution of BIM has been that, that it's moved beyond just a representation of what my intent is to some intelligence. And, uh, and when I create that element or that object, how it behaves in space and the association that it has around it with geospatial information, uh, time, cost, and, and other elements. And so the diagram that I often use is this here where, you know, for years I've, I've come from the construction industry. And so for years we've been trying to marry cost and schedule and, uh, and so that we can get uh, performance aspects. Are we using the right labor, the right equipment, the right machines on the job? Uh, unfortunately, projects, if your project doesn't end in a B for a billion dollars or more, it's hard to actually track this level of data. You have to have dedicated staff. By the time you get the reports, it's 30 days old, right? The, the vision is that when you bring in BIM as this connector, BIM down to the part level, we can actually now associate space. We can associate geospatial information, cost, 
time, right, and pull this together. And in construction, there's just a lot of starts and stops. We do our quantity survey, our estimate to win the job at the right price. Then we schedule it on how we're going to put it in place. And we don't necessarily use the same data because, of course, I want it organized differently as the scheduler. And then we organize it how we want to manage and procure it, which is yet another uh, uh, aspect of it. And so when we bring it down to the part level, the door is the door and it can fulfill all of those hierarchy of needs and, and, uh, and how we, we measure and analyze that data. So that's a, a key aspect. And I think for the GeoBIM concept, a key aspect for how we bring this together is getting down to that part level. Uh, sometimes I hear it as the constructible uh, level of, uh, of detail. And then we'll talk a little bit about quantities by location and what that can also provide uh, here as I move forward. So when I talk about building information modeling, this is not a complete list of, uh, of it, so, um, but it's just to give some ideas. The, the wave of BIM, I think McGraw-Hill describes it as there were three waves that really started in design and the planning. Uh, construction now has adopted it, and you can see the numbers from uh, the screen pre-show here on the, the adoption levels are, are getting fairly high. And now the third wave coming into facility management, operations and management, uh, which we'll, we'll talk about. And, and this is just another kind of depiction of that adoption. Here, what, what, what I find interesting is this is from some McGraw-Hill data as well, where you can see the yellow bars are the adoption levels. Now this is about a year old and this is globally uh, averaged together, right? Uh, but then the blue dots are from contractors and engineers saying, where do we see the opportunity uh, for BIM? And you'll notice that it comes in the second half. So while it's heavily adopted in the front hand, there's a lot of opportunity yet to come. Now, that has to deal with all kinds of things, including human change and process uh, to achieve those opportunities. But I think in the essence of this conference, one of the other key aspects is that spatial context matters, it matters in all of those spaces. Um, I think to get to some of the next levels as we move to the right and get into the actual constructible aspects that you leverage with BIM, that space, spatial aspect and the geospatial uh, tie becomes very relevant. So one little kind of case study example here is the Louis Vuitton building. And it's a great representation of, uh, of BIM and leveraging across that life cycle. Uh, these types of buildings, uh, including other projects like the Bird's Nest in Beijing, just wouldn't be possible without this kind of technology and process. Um, there was a lot of analysis done on how to navigate this building so that the, the inhabitant or the user doesn't have to recreate their path um, and they can experience this building in a new way. Uh, there was about 400 engineers that worked on this project, or architects that worked on this across 15 countries. And so this type of technology allowed them to coordinate and, and operate in that dispersed version. And, and then they, of course, they handed over this information for the operates and operations and, and management. So a great case study of just what we can do across the life cycle with BIM. On the spatial concept here, there's a lot of words, and I'm not going to read this slide to you, but uh, the point here is that think about space in uh, not just a, a position or a point, um, but also in the, the attributes and the behaviors of space. So where am I in, in context to the coffee shop or the restroom? Uh, where, am I, where is this conference room in context to where the air handler unit is? What areas does the air handler unit service? Um, right? Where is this light going to be achieved? Um, so we need to think about it on these multiple levels of how what space means and, uh, and location. And I, I use this example as well where this is a real screen scraped from my, my phone where I was looking for a Starbucks as we most do when we travel frequently. And, uh, and in this, this version here, you can see that there's two Starbucks that are 0.4 miles away. And uh, what I want to introduce here is the concept of context, which I think is, is pretty basic. But when I use another app to look for the Starbucks, the, the one on the left, the Starbucks look the same by the data that I see. They're both 0.4 miles away. But when I can see it visually and understand the location of where it is, I, re I can recognize that one Starbucks is right down the road from my hotel on a lit pathway, right, on a heavily traveled area versus going behind the scenes. And so just like BIM is a connector, now the spatial aspect is yet another connector. And specifically, I want to, to, to kind of label context, right, uh, for the moment. So here's the same kind of phases that you saw earlier, the plan, design, construct, facility management. Um, again, not exclusive lists, but you saw a lot of what we can do in the planning phase here earlier this morning. Um, and, and if I think about where geospatial professionals reside, they're, they're involved early on getting the, uh, the data collection of an environment. Uh, surveying, uh, 
In the construction side, we often see them for control or layout, um, volumetric calculations if you're in infrastructure for a stockpile or, or, or those things. But I'd like to kind of broaden the categories of where the geospatial professional can help throughout those life cycles. And again, this is just a, a summary of some areas where, where they can evolve with that spatial aspect. Well, they worked in my dry run, but hey, we'll improvise. So there was two short videos. What you were gonna see here was the first one is taking, um, this is taking the physical world and bringing it to the virtual world. So what, what it was showing is a prototype device with Google um, called Tango, where actually you can walk around the room and, and uh, with the, uh, has, is highly aware of location right and, uh, and accuracy of location so I could take pictures of this room and it would automatically create a model for me in, um, in SketchUp in this case so that I could go out there and capture that physical into my, my virtual to go back and run energy analysis or whatever analysis I, I, I would prefer. The second example is showing the context of position but now bringing the virtual into the physical so I'm in the same room and I have actually the, uh, the model loaded on the device so I can see in wall. So I can walk around and actually get my augmented reality, virtual reality, to see what's behind the wall. Um, you've seen technology, you may have seen technology like this before, but I think it's the marriage of the model with geospatial that's going to actually make it useful because it's the, it's, uh, the accuracy really matters here. If you're off by a meter or five meters, that's a big deal, right? So uh, uh, the, the devices that you see here, um, uh, if you would have seen the videos, are providing a high level of accuracy, which is the key uh, in location, which is the key element. And then, of course, Microsoft HoloLens. You may have seen some of the videos on Microsoft HoloLens, uh, a similar concept, where now you're bringing mixed reality with the glass so that I can actually um, uh, see the virtual, that, that mixed reality, the virtual and the physical together. So now we've talked BIM and we've talked the, uh, the spatial side. The next key element is this, this concept of, I, I have a hard time naming this concept. Is it connectedness? Is it continuously connected? Is it network? But the aspect is that we now need it to be a living, breathing connection between the model and the geospatial information. Harvard did a study about the three waves of technology where I'll use a purchase order as an example. The first wave of technology was that uh, we could automate the creation of a purchase order. The second wave of technology was that we can do business to business with that purchase order so that now I can share that with my supply chain and we're all speaking the same language, right? Similar topics here, OGC, Building Smart. And the third wave of technology was now I'm continuously connected to that purchase order and that purchase order is connected, continuously connected to me as people and to the material or the goods or the product as well. So it knows when it's been shipped, when it's on site, when it's to the consumer. Right? Uh, RFID tags on a CD music album, as an example. So it's this continuous connection now that will really help bring these two, these two worlds together. Um, so if I go back into the construction, put my construction hat on for a moment, uh, here back with the, the BIM model, this object is more than the 3D representation. It describes how this needs to be built, how much labor, equipment, material needs to be leveraged uh, to, to put this column in place. Uh, I have productivity rates of how much concrete I can pour, how much drywall I can hang. Um, and, uh, and then that association of this data allows me to calculate aspects like cost, schedule, and what this diagram is missing, I think, the key to this, this audience's position as well. So I can know what I need to do, where the anchor bolts need to go to be positioned. And as a, as a former project manager, I used to work in uh, building healthcare, uh, hospitals, and, and uh, facilities. And my job was really these questions every morning. Do I have the right staff here? Are they working in the right location? Because I need to make sure they get this area done so I can get the next trade in. Do I have the right material? Is it on site? Is it ready to be installed? Right? Do I have the right equipment, the lift, the bush hammer, whatever I need to, to do my job? Um, so labor, equipment, material, uh, tracking uh, day to day was my, as a project manager, was my, uh, my norm. Uh, the, uh, we used to call it LEM, or labor equipment material. I've put a fourth category in here, which is progress, because I think with the technology and how it's advanced, there's ways to automate measuring progress as well. And my point here with these four categories is that technologies exist today to continuously network you know, all of this, uh, this uh, uh, the key aspects to, to, to performing the job, the labor, equipment, material. So 
uh, Trimble and many of the sponsors here have these technologies that you can create these connections. Now what you need to do is everything, uh, there's you know, social, political, human aspects to change. So each one of these has a different level and kind of phase on how you can automate it. So let's take material. I can go from my paper-based process to a tablet to collect and track. Phase two is I can actually start tagging RFID tags, barcodes, and track that information. Those same waves of technology we talked about earlier. And then phase three is you know, we have technology where we have technology now in a crane that we've got prototype where the crane knows what to pick and where to place it. Right? So we can go to that, that full automation and I could talk the same waves through, the, for, through people and through tools. And, uh, and now we have to phase that in with our, our uh, uh, aspects of where we get the return, our human change, the process. So here's just showing BIM and spatial data being combined now with uh, continuously connected to the resource. So I can see the resources working in this area. Um, and, uh, and then the, uh, the promise I was talking earlier about kind of earn value concepts. I don't really like that word because it's a scary word. It means a whole lot of work. But what I mean is production control. We can eventually start to, as we further automate these things and continuously connect this data, we can get real production control, real decision making uh, uh, tools. And then the next chapter is integrated workspace management. So now we're into, we have to maintain and operate this facility. So here's some, some interesting statistics. I think the first is that after people, the building is the second uh, uh, largest cost of a, an organization typically. Uh, of that building I spoke earlier, 40% of a building at any time is being used, which means 60% is, is unused. And, uh, and that no doubt leads to the upper right, which is 50% in, in the US. There was a study that of the 70% energy waste, 50% of it comes from buildings, right? So if you think about it, and I know I can speak for, for Trimble and our experience that uh, we are very virtual today. And, uh, and so there's often rooms that, that can go weeks without being used in the corner of an office, which is being lit and heated and cooled, right? And, and so uh, uh, transforming to new ways of thinking and how we think about workspaces is, is really critical. And of course, this is where the bulk of the cost actually comes in, even though it comes in the shortest period of time in construction, it's actually more cost over the run of the, the asset. So Gartner's done some research on workspace management and thinking in this new age of virtual workspaces, how the, uh, that you have to look at the entire environment, not just the conference rooms and the lobbies, but the parks around it and the, the courtyards and, and how we can utilize that space more, uh, more effectively, more efficiently. And so when we bring this data and we start tracking the asset information um, uh, through the, uh, the information management of the model, with the geospatial data and connecting this, um, the, the benefits that we can provide on knowing you know, what air handler unit is serving what room, how often is this room being used, automatically dialing down temperature or lights during peak or, or slow times uh, can create significant savings. And I think one of the best examples is here in town, right, with the edge. What a fabulous story here in the, uh, this building of how it's just continuously connected to I drive in and it knows by my license plate I'm here, it knows my calendar for the day, there's no assigned seating in that building, right? It then, it then puts me into that space to get the best, uh, enable me for, for what I need to do that, uh, that day. And I think there's a lot to learn there. When we started, um, so we supply some technology on this and when we started using this in our own um, aspects of, uh, of our facilities at Trimble, we actually were about to build a second building and we, in our Colorado office and we put it on hold and we have now gone a year and just by changing the dedicated space to more of a hoteling workspace, right, saved the need to, to, to procure this additional building. So it's, uh, we're, we're also living with these kinds of results which is, uh, um, yeah, they're real, right, and, uh, and not that hard to achieve. And then the last chapter here is just collaboration and uh, I'll be brief on this but it takes us all so we can talk about this vision and this transformation, but what it means is we have to be able to liberate information and share information. And this is really about the I that was talked about earlier by, by Rob to bring this together. Um, we've got to be able to share across people have to come together. We have to be able to share information. When I drill into a person, there's a number of technologies they use. And uh, so technology providers like, like Trimble and, uh, and others have to be better about liberating and opening that data up um, so that it can work 
uh, with, uh, with uh, people that maybe are on a different version or a different set of software. I know coming from the construction world and being in a technology uh, environment, I'd love to see people use more and more of our Trimble technology, but even if they standardize 100% on it, you're one project away from a joint venture, a partnership, a different set of teams from using something else, so it has to work. You know, the, the language, we have to have these common languages that, that OGC and uh, Build Sync Smart and City XML are driving toward. It's, it's really critical, and we have to be able to support that. So in, in conclusion here, just talking about these, I think these are some of the key, key enablers that can bring the geospatial aspects and BIM together, and, uh, and then the transformations that, uh, that I believe we can see. And of course there's, uh, of course there's others, and, and, uh, and I'm excited to see what comes of today because there's a lot of other key topics that, that today and tomorrow that drill in here, how you bring underground data with above ground data, how you bring indoor positioning with outdoor positioning, how you bring geodetic coordinates with Cartesian coordinates, right? There's a lot that has to come together uh, and for this. And so it's, uh, I'm looking forward to, uh, to participating and seeing the discussions. Mm -hmm.